Open Science Festival. Meet, share, inspire, So we we'll now continue with our second keynote of this festival. And this keynote uh, will be held by Dr. Daniel Mietjen. He has currently two positions. Um, the first one is at the Fitz Karlsruhe Leibniz Institute for Information Infrastructure and at the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries. Daniel has a background in biophysics and holds a PhD in physics. He worked at many different institutions, both in Germany and in the US. And his talk will be on open research in practice iterating between ideas, communities, and societal impact. Daniel, the floor is yours. Please start with the presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, the first thing I would like to say about open research and practice is it is open for, uh, to, for anyone to participate if they want to. And so if you have an electronic device that can connect to the internet, that then can connect to an etherpad like this, please pull it out and try to connect to this uh, URL that I've highlighted here. It's relatively short, easy to remember. And uh, yeah, because open science is really about co-creating science, uh, collaborating in science, improving the way science is being done. Science is being adapted to what society needs. And that's where the impact comes from and what uh, the community engagement uh, part is. Um, a little word about my setup here. At some point, uh, after giving a keynote, I was uh, approached by a veteran keynote speaker who uh, had to tell me a number of good things about the content of my talk, but he ended his comment with, you can't give a keynote without a tie. And so I brought a tie here, and um, I chose to give it a, a meaning, actually, because I, so far I haven't really, I, I failed to see the meaning in wearing ties otherwise, but this one, represents the climate stripes that you may have heard about. And so uh, whatever I say here on the podium, please uh, keep in mind that there are big societal problems and we should really try to adapt science to work in this framework, to contribute to that. Whatever we do as scientists, we should keep those big societal issues in mind. And so this is a token of uh, for, for that. OK. Uh, so back to the practice. Um, what's the structure of the presentation here? Um, I will make this a little smaller here. Um, it's first I have a monologue, as is expected for a keynote, uh, but I'll keep it short to about 15 minutes. And then 30 minutes, we will try to do something together. We will work together on the first aspects of a research project. And uh, yeah, I, I can do this on my own. I've done it a few times, but really this is about participation. So get ready for that. But I'll, I'll give you 15 minutes to get in the, into that mood. And then after about half an hour, we will round this up. We will try to discuss next steps, how, whether we will continue on the path towards this particular research project. Um, also, uh, we will have discussion questions. And we will also maybe reflect a bit on what it was like for us to be part of this first kind of collaborative way of uh, starting a research project. OK, now on to the monologue part. Um, this will first start with a number of comments on a keynote from yesterday and the discussions I've had here at the festival. So um, the first one is actually on the meaning of open science, open research. So for that, I will, return, I will turn to a website that you may have heard about which has a nice video on the subject. Open research. Open research is the concept of scientists sharing their research with the world as soon as they record it for themselves. This is essential to make research more efficient than it is today. Research resembles a puzzle. A heap of pieces has to be assembled into a coherent picture. Yet some of the pieces are unknown, and traditional non-open science keeps much of the remainder hidden behind barriers erected by pre-digital reputation and reward systems. Open science means tackling research problems collaboratively by sharing research tools, data, materials, and code as they arise, and by building on the shared work. As Beethoven said, 
there should be only one repository of research in the world to which the artist would donate his works in order to take what he would need. Ideally, scientific research would be in the public domain by default, and Beethoven's repository would be federated rather than centralized. Yeah, okay. So, while we appreciate uh, the work by Beethoven, um, we can also consider that this video was made more than a decade ago, and not much has changed, actually. Um, there are more people who have heard about the concept of open research or open science. There are more people who have it in their, uh, even in their job title, but there are still not many more people who practice it. Now we can in increase the number of people who practice it uh, today. Oh yeah, we get arrows here. That's also part of open science. Um, yeah, another thing uh, that uh, uh, kind of came out of Benedict's talk yesterday, instead of asking what open science means, we should actually ask how meaning emerges in open science. And I'm repeating this here. I will repeat it again a few minutes later. And in the meantime, I want you to think about it with the following additional inputs. So um, about what we do as scientists, um, we often have values, but they are often not really, well, somebody is really playing games with me here. Um, we don't necessarily express those values in a way that, are, that is actionable or that uh, makes it easy for others. Ha. <laughs> Somebody's game, playing games with me. Anyway, so you can click on these links on your own. Um, and uh, so here, this line, let me see what it is. It's line 18 in the pad uh, has a link to my pledges, my way of doing research. I've tried to formalize this. I'm in the process of making this machine understandable uh, with the idea that if somebody else has expressed their own mission their own scientific values in a similar machine-readable fashion, then we can actually use this as a search engine to find people who share our values, who want to collaborate on uh, similar premises. That would then shorten uh, lots of the discussions at the beginning of a project. It would also uh, keep out the middlemen, the, the lawyers, who often say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. But here we would have a mechanism by which we express certain aspects of it. Um, yeah, then. Um, the same thing actually exists for um, institutions or, or organizations in general. I'm just sharing a blog post here uh, or a manifesto of someone who's actually in the room here. And there I noticed uh, a bug that needs fixing. Um, and uh, so this is uh, still not actionable. So uh, also the uh, library here at ZB Met, they have a mission statement. But how does the mission actually interfere when you're actually doing the things that you're doing on a daily basis? I want little helpers to help you do these things. When you're to doing something that is, <laughs> yeah, li like this, in a way. <laughs> uh, I'm doing something wrong. Somebody tries to tell me something. Um, so I'm just doing what it tells me, control F5. And uh, then, basically, I would be more mission aligned, right? Uh, that is not really what I planned here. Um, but hey, in, in a way, it, it is on topic. Um, then what? Uh, is societal impact. <laughs> yeah, OK. So uh, in theory, I, there should be other uh, networks here. If, we, if you're all uh, connected via the same network, this might be one of the problems here. Um, but I do encourage you to give it a try. If we fail on infrastructure reasons, well, we have an infrastructure uh, facility to talk to. Um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, I already talked about the warming stripes. If you don't know what this is, line 24 gives you an explanation of what this tie stands for. Then. Um, Another way to approach the open research is to think about um, open research pathways, how to start this. I have a talk about this in line 25. I'm not going to go there. Uh, similar things. What can do uh, library, libraries and similar infrastructures do in order to facilitate open science? I'm not going to talk about this. There is a talk linked here from in line 26. There are bottle openers that you may have seen lying around here. I have one of those. And uh, I actually think it's a very interesting representation of um, the uh, research process and the role that the library here sees in themselves. So what they do is they provide us with a mechanism to open a commercial product that encapsulates something that has been done in a way that we can't see. Accurate representation of how we share science these days, right? And um, also, it doesn't allow me to actually see the process, how the thing was brewed that I'm opening here. I'm just getting the opener to get the bottled product. I don't see the process. But what I'm talking about is actually sharing the process. 
Um, yeah, and so how can we share the process? OK, here is an earlier attempt of doing this. So this is a, uh, a remake, uh, also a more than a decade old, this thing here. Uh, so uh, it is a GIF that alternates between two different pictures. One of them has the research cycle where publishing is a separate step. The other one has the research cycle where publishing essentially happens at every step. And open science is the, the letter one where publishing happens at every step. If you have an idea, you can publish that. If you have a data management plan, you can publish that. If you have a grant proposal, you can publish that. If you have a workshop report, you can publish that. That's the kind of open science way of doing things. Um, then um, there are other ways to uh, get informed about uh, how uh, things work. So for instance, on Wikimedia Commons, there is a nice category, biologists at work. So um, I sometimes look at this uh, to get some inspiration, uh, like how can we share research workflows more openly? So just consider this here. What do we know about the research that was going on there? What do we know about these individual things here? What is published in the literature? Um, what, how much of what they were doing here is actually published? How much of it is still in the freezer, in the drawers, and so on? Uh, and yeah, we can just go through. <laughs> Uh, you can imagine this, uh, like how much of the data that they've gathered there is actually published? How much of the data, uh, the, the method that they were using there is documented? How can I easily follow up? It's probably not much, right? Um, yeah, then there was a, a session uh, about uh, basically the um, credit roles. How do we... Um, appreciate those who have contributed to a process, and there are a number 14 uh, roles that are foreseen here. In the context of authorship of a manuscript, we don't have similar kinds of roles in other contexts of, of the research uh, ecosystem. And uh, I would like to point out a few of those. So for instance, the lurker, what you're doing right now, uh, and what I was doing a long time. The first open science bits and pieces that I've seen were all in chemistry. I'm a biophysicist, so I'm ki I kind of know that chemistry exists, but I'm always dancing around because it's not really my specialty, right? But the first times I saw open science were all in chemistry, and so I was diving into chemistry, not because I was attracted by the chemistry, but by their way of doing science. And I tried to do it in my biophysical en environments, and people, the senior leadership, they told me, no, we're not going to do this kind of thing. We're doing serious science. We're not sharing before it's peer-reviewed, these kinds of things, right? Well, um, <laughs> I stuck with the chemists for that one. Um, then uh, how can we document processes? OK, so here is one that I like, but it typically takes a bit to understand. So let me explain a bit. Um, what we have here is some animal, some larva of an insect. And um, what it does, it's feeding. And uh, what I like about it is you actually see it has already done a bit. So th this part of the leaf is gone. I'm lacking the documentation. I would like to see this documented. OK, it's documented somewhat in here. Um, you also see what the plan is, where they plan to go next. So they have already shared some saliva. And so the starch in that part of the leaf is already kind of getting uh, prepared for digestion, right? And so in a way, this is a static representation of a process that is going on. You have an idea. You can imagine what was uh, j coming just before and what is next. Um, yeah, then there are other ways of sharing processes. You can, uh, for instance, um, take a video. So here is one um, where somebody is sharing a process. Interesting here, they take breaks. It's not always going smoothly. If, if you would read the paper about this, they just said, oh, we solved the Rubik's Cube. And of course, they were all doing it in a direct fashion, the most intelligent way. They don't really, we don't really talk about the pauses that we take, or sometimes uh, the sidesteps, or like e even uh, empty or dead ends or anything like that. Right? We only talk about the good parts. We don't, we don't share the, uh, the complex aspects of the system, or uh, the mis... <sighs> Yeah, the, uh, well, the problems. <laughs> um, there are other ways. So uh, here I'm linking to a research paper that actually looked into how you can share different kinds of uh, research outputs and what people then look at. So we have data about uh, which parts of a research proposal people actually look at. <sighs> Set be made, we need to talk about these pop-ups here. Something's wrong with the Wi-Fi settings, I have to say. Um, so. Um, 
here, if you need further ins inspiration in terms of uh, how to share this, we can actually go through the individual steps of the research cycle. So um, if you need input or ideas about uh, research ideas, grant proposals, here's a link. Um, and uh, one aspect I would like to mention you, that you could see if you were to click there is every item in there is actually mapped to the sustainable development goals. That's another thing that research doesn't normally do. And it goes back to the societal impact thing. Um, then uh, data management plans the same. Very few data management plans are actually shared, but more, there is huge demand on actually writing useful data management plans. And there is this strange idea that, that you could actually use data management plans to uh, what is in their name, to actually manage data rather than taking a box in the grant pro uh, proposal process. And um, technically, it's possible. Uh, another aspect uh, that I like to focus on in the research cycle are actually those things that don't get much attention. So for instance, ethics statements, um, or the ethics process in general. Uh, when I started uh, zooming in on open science, I thought the grant proposal was the, the darkest corner. No, ethics is much darker. Uh, you can find thousands of grant proposals shared on the internet, but try to find public documentation of what happens uh, during an ethics uh, uh, request or ethics approval process. It's very hard to find, and which also makes it hard to teach because you have essentially only black boxes to look at, and uh, that hi hinder hinders standardization. Um, yeah, so uh, another aspect, reproducibility, that is my t-shirt here. So I went to JupyterCon in order to talk about um, Jupyter Notebooks, which are a, a way to share code, um, that were associated with public uh, with papers that were published. And so the papers had gone through peer review, and we re-ran all those Jupyter notebooks. Uh, short story, most of them did not reproduce, not computationally. We didn't even look at the science, just at the computation aspects. And there are systemic reasons for this, and we're trying to tackle that. And But this entire project was run as an, op as an open science project. It started essentially from a GitHub issue uh, six years ago that you can look at, and then from there you can find our way to the preprint and uh, to the data, to the code, and to the JupyterCon talk, for instance. And uh, I'm also working on a project uh, on bringing a reproducibility aspects to hardware, open hardware, and so there's a link here. This project's currently ongoing. You can all dive in here and try to reproduce the hardware that's in there. Um, yeah, another aspect. I'm, uh, almost at the end of my 15 minutes here. Um, so when I, what I noticed when I entered the building here is the, the vending machine for the earplugs. Um, in a way, it makes sense in the library, but <laughs> uh, I found it odd that this is kind of placed so prominently here. Uh, so what is it about uh, set be made that I should be seeing when I enter here? OK, it's information about this conference, yes. But then the next big thing very prominently is the earplugs. And well, I understand I've been to libraries often enough that I see a number of users for ear earplugs that are relevant. Um, and in open science, actually, we need something similar to these earplugs. Uh, because if you're working in an open way, there is the danger that you're interrupted all the time. Typically, this doesn't happen, because when you're doing things in the open, nobody actually cares, just like in a closed environment. But sometimes people do. And then uh, you don't know whether it's one or two or 15 or more, right? And sometimes it can get annoying to constantly be interrupted. And so what we need is actually windows for interaction. When I say this, people often hear windows with a capital W. No, that's not what I mean. Um, and I saw lots of Windows computers around here as well. Uh, that's definitely not what I mean. But it's things like a feedback button. It's things like a thank you button. It's things like an edit button. So while I'm working on my stuff, I'm completely comfortable with others editing on GitHub, on Wiki, or somewhere in a pad the things that I'm working on, um, as long as there is a way to keep track of the versioning so that I can see, I can go back, I can check on my own schedule uh, what has changed. OK, so with these remarks, I would now like to switch to the co-working part of the session. So I hope you all have your devices ready. and. Uh, I would like to introduce that with, again, the, th the thing that uh, Benedict said yesterday. Instead of asking what open science means, we should ask how meaning emerges in open science. And at that point, I hope that we might have a chance to look at um, the graphic recording that we have. Maybe uh, the tech, uh, tech guys back then can bring this onto the monitor. I haven't seen it, OK. But in a way, that is how the, the pro some processes emerge. Maybe you can put that on one of the screens and uh, 
or yeah, for the moment, the pad. <laughs> uh, these error messages are really annoying. I haven't had them at that scale yet. Um, so do, you, do we see the graphic recording? Yes, OK, so, uh, so let's have a look. Yeah, OK, so um, you saw that that was empty beforehand, and now um, there, there is some structure emerging. Um, if you can, maybe leave one of the, uh, the screens for the recording and uh, the other screen for the pad. Um, so now, no, that's not possible. OK, then go for the pad, and we will switch back to the recording but later on. Um, so now, um, I want us to start a research project here and now. And of course, you didn't expect that, so I'm completely uh, not surprised if you say, well, I didn't prepare this, right? It's completely fine. But if by any chance somebody has a research project that they want to start anyway, um, like, for instance, you, you plan to write it up tomorrow already or so, just give us a shout. Now is your chance. You get like 50 people half an hour, 25 person hours for free, right? No? Okay, well then, I have prepared something. And <laughs> um, it is actually the idea of um, trying to assess the environmental footprint of the facility we're in, set be made. Okay, uh, the idea is not too complex. I hope everybody understands what it is. I opened a GitHub ticket about it, but we don't need that right now. And uh, here I have trouble logging into GitHub anyway. So um, the basic idea is, assessing the environmental footprint of an organization, and we're taking this organization as an example. Uh, yesterday, I briefly inquired as to whether that has already happened. No. So we are not repeating something that has already happened. And so we can start from scratch. And uh, yeah, what we, do we need for this? Um, and here, I would really like for your input. It's most appropriate to put it directly into the pad. Uh, and uh, we can start with that. Um, while we're doing this, we can also, uh, some of us, can zoom out and think about, okay, what's, what are the next steps? So uh, what do we need we, uh, for research projects? We need some sort of administration. We need some way, where do we store the files? We need to agree on the licensing. We need to agree on how to distribute responsibilities. And some people can already start zooming in on maybe look into the literature. Have other institutions already determined their environmental footprint in some way? Or maybe some conferences have. Right? We can dive in the literature. OK, um, I don't see anyone typing, so that part of the experiment didn't work out. I've done a similar experiment with students uh, just a month ago, and they were all typing at this point. Um, maybe you're just too old. Maybe I just framed it uh, in, a in a wrong way. Um, maybe you're exhausted from the conference. Um, anyway, in that case, it's always the presenter's fault. Um, so I will then continue the monologue, but I will uh, look in towards you more often because I want interaction. I can do monologues, but uh, we are here for interaction. Conferences, they are places for exchange. They're not places for having the wisdom flow in one direction or anything like that. Uh, also yesterday, Ben Benedict was standing here. One of the most frequent phrases that he said is, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this thing. That's true for in almost all circumstances for almost anyone. And uh, so, please, think about ways in which your wisdom can be shared here, right? So, okay. Um, yes, somebody came in and did something in the pad. I don't know yet what. Write down the question. Yes, okay. Well, thanks, very good. So, let's assess the environmental footprint of the ZB. It. Okay, so that is our research question. Or so um, actually, research question would uh, end with a question tag. So what is uh, the? I'm actually working as one of my projects on formalizing what a research question is, so that you could express that in a way that is machine understandable. But that is a bit too complex to do in this. Um, Thing. Okay, what is environmental? Okay, uh, what is an environmental footprint? Oh my goodness! Uh, it basically means, yeah, what environmental resources are we using? Uh, how much waste are we producing? Um, oh yeah, interesting thing. Yeah, while I wasn't seeing things, yeah, what belongs to? Yeah, this is what I wanted to see. P 
people are starting to think along those lines. They are contributing this. And I don't know how far we get in those 30 minutes, but here is already something that we are uh, seeing in the right direction. So yeah, if we say uh, we want to assess what is the, <laughs> yeah, somebody, uh, we had trouble uh, syncing here. It's complex technology actually going on here. Um, anyway, um, w what we want to see is that we decompose the problem into manageable units. So some people will say, okay, what's the environmental, what's an environmental footprint of, of anything? And then all, some others will say, okay, what is set limit? Right? And maybe we want to start with just some aspects, because in the half an hour we can't do any all, all of it anyway, so maybe uh, try to get some feeling for it. And the more colors you see here, the more people are actually, or the more accounts are actually involved uh, by, uh, by now. Um, yeah, okay, so we need to define key variables. It's, for instance, it's energy usage, it's water usage, it is uh, waste production, things like that, right? And we can look it all up. Wiki has entries on this, there are papers on this. Uh, but I didn't prepare this such that uh, we would just uh, repeat what I had done before. I want this to be co-create. And I also uh, want this to be done in a way that could actually lead to ZBMED eventually actually assessing their footprint, and maybe in a way that others can build on it. Because I've seen a number of papers that uh, have assessed the footprint of some aspect of the research ecosystem, but they didn't really share their workflow. So again, it's a black box, we have to believe them. And also, importantly, we can't copy what they have done already and maybe adapt it to our own circumstances, right? But if ZBMED has done it, maybe some other library can do it as well on their basis. They will have to change some parameters, but by and large, uh, the uh, method should work for other libraries, right? And so on and for other organizations, or uh, for the conferences. Actually, a number of conferences have done it already, um, but again, they haven't really shared their workflows. They've all only done it internally, and then they came up with numbers. Um, so typically, those conferences were larger ones, conferences with tens of thousands of uh, participants, and they typically have a footprint like uh, a, a large city over a year, something like this because so many people are flying in. The, the big one is the flights. And so for this conference, if you were to do it on a smaller scale, just this conference, it's probably the, the largest impact is probably from the flights. And then there are other things uh, like the building and, and the food and things like that, right? Uh, then also uh, one aspect we haven't really looked into that that would fall under the ZBMED part is what is ZBMED actually doing? What are the activities of ZBMED and which of these activities actually have um, which kind of environmental footprint, right? It is, uh, yeah, surface, ceiling, yeah, lots of things are popping up here. Um, really appreciate the diversity of the colors here because they represent diversity of viewpoints, diversity of contributions. And in many other contexts, we don't have an easy way to visualize that. That was the main purpose why I was using the pad. If we were using uh, a more neutral, like a Google Doc, a Wiki, a GitHub, or anything like that, it would all be the same color, and we wouldn't see the diversity of the viewpoints. Okay. Um, I like it if people contribute via the pad. You can also post questions here. Uh, currently, line 131, we can start posting questions, comments, and also observations, like you in introspectively reflecting on what this process is doing to you, or just observing the process. If you're typing in this pad, trying to think about this current research project that we're starting, share those thoughts. Type it in. Or if you don't have a, uh, a machine with you where you can type it in, you can ask your neighbor or so, something like this. Or you can just ask directly. We still have a direct communication channel here while we're in the same room. Often, when you start something in open science, you collaborate with people you've never been in the same room with. And uh, so you don't have that uh, extra channel. OK, um, I'm still kind of trying to digest the, the input that we get here. Um, so yeah, material used for construction work of housing. Yeah, a another aspect uh, that we haven't talked about yet is, so some of those things will be private. Um, these are things that are hard to assess from the outside. And so uh, we will have to ha have a mechanism by which um, we decide whether we include that in the assessment or not. And if we include it, then how do we uh, kind of uh, include it? Um, and 
that will be the part that will absolutely need to be adapted if we were to copy that workflow to another library, for instance, right? Uh, they will have internal data as well. They may not want to share it the same way or not at all, or even to, uh, to a larger extent that, than that we made. We don't know. Um, but there are things that are internal. And the, what are these internal things? It's things like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Depends on what is internal, actually, right? Um, it, it is uh, details of what's in the contracts and, and things like that. Details of who works in which room uh, and when uh, and what are they doing in there. Things like that. Some of these things are things that uh, are private or should be private or could be considered private. Things like that. Um, but other things are already public information. We just need to gather it in a way that is uh, ready to be analyzed for environmental footprint considerations. And also, we have to keep in mind that there are already uh, assessments of entire countries in terms of environmental footprint. Uh, and so if we have an assessment for Germany, well, maybe we can kind of uh, use that uh, as a proxy for the things where we have missing data or private data for ZBMED, right? Um, yeah, and some questions pop up. Do we include the building or just the operation of the building? Well, at some point, we have to make decisions. That's the same for any research project. Uh, we initially, we start out with some research question, and the, the deeper we drill in, at some point, we have to make a decision. And the point of doing this in an open science way would be we ask the question, we provide an answer to the question, and both of these are public. And if somebody wants to challenge that, they can open a ticket, basically, and we can have a discussion about that, right? But the, the point of doing this in an open science fashion is to have a trail record, to have uh, a way to rationalize over uh, the things that um, led to the final research output, right? If so, suppose at some point we're going to publish the uh, environmental footprint of ZBMED, uh, then uh, these things will have influenced the result, but that's often not visible in the result. And uh, lots of the decisions that are being made on the way, they're not properly recorded, and they're certainly not in the paper. They might be somewhere in the notebook or whatever notes you took in the research process, but they're very rarely in the paper. Okay, can we learn from others? So somebody has already gone into the literature, right? The carbon footprint of libraries has been calculated for the first time. Let's have a look here. Um, somebody has some cookies. Okay, so two years ago, somebody claims that uh, some library was the first to um, assess their environmental footprint. Okay, Kalu Library from Helsinki. Okay, that's perhaps worth ha taking a look at. Here, I'm, I just won't click on an Elsevier link. Um, and, uh, okay, yeah, some more comment here. Please put, put the comments here. Can we reuse research data? Which data exactly? What data will we get and how to organize it? Yeah, okay. We probably have a few people here who know something about data management. Uh, so uh, they could actually come in here uh, and then uh, make data management suggestions. Something like this, right? Uh, maybe there is even already a standard way of handling uh, data management for a new research project at ZBMED. If that is the case, we could just plug it in and we are ready to go. Um, which infrastructure do we need? Yes, we need an uh, infrastructure. We're currently using this pad, which for some reason has stopped giving me those warnings. Interestingly, I have no idea why, but I'm glad that it did. Um, and. Um, so beyond that, what other infrastructure do we need? We need some place to store data about the individual components of what an, uh, an environmental footprint is, of what made is, what the activities at made are, and whatever uh, we have. We could start with a spreadsheet, but we could uh, each entry in each cell of the spreadsheet probably needs some sort of a documentation trail. And so maybe a spreadsheet is not the best thing. Maybe we need an actual database or whatever. But yeah, that's the kind of things we need to do. And actually, for starting a research project, there should be default ways of doing this, of starting this, uh, so that not every research or every research team has to rethink the same questions all over again. And so best practice of data management is if there is a recommendation of how to do it in your institute or in your discipline or for your kind of research, just go with that. And only deviate from it if you have a good reason, and then document that reason, right? So I hope that someone in this environmental footprint field or someone in the library slash ZBMED field already has some default setup for data management, and then we can just go with that. 
other infrastructure uh, that we need. We probably need access to literature, right? Things like uh, these things here that uh, are beginning to pop up. Uh, we need maybe some means to com compute, to store data. Maybe we need to actually uh, request some non-public data. So we need to have some sort of a um, process to get those non-public data and so on. Um, which tools do we use? Yeah. Um, there are lots of project management uh, things that need to be dis uh, discussed and decided upon early on. And very often, the default is to some closed uh, commercial product, which um, makes it difficult for others to come in. So uh, in terms of open science, if you want to open the process, you can't use a closed tool that uh, requires institutional access to be part of that conversation, right? Um, yeah, then to what extent is Set Bimet interested in this project? Well, I don't expect them to jump on it uh, right now because it was just <laughs> announced, right? Uh, it's completely fine if Set Bimet at some point says, no, we're not going to do it this way. Uh, but I hope that at some point they're going to access, uh, assess uh, their own environmental footprint because essentially every part of society has to do it in, in some way. And um, what I like about uh, researchers assessing the research ecosystem is that's the part that we can actually control. We can't really control much of the higher polit political sphere unless we bribe them, right? Um, and scientists don't normally do that. And, uh, but we can control that part of the research ecosystem that we do control. And so we can assess the environmental footprints and also assess what measures can be taken to reduce that environmental footprint or to even come up with, reason, with estimates of what is the reasonable environmental footprint of a library, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, laws in Europe and Germany uh, about how to do environmental impact assessment. Yeah, okay, and we start thinking about who will be our readers. For instance, now that we've started this research project in an open science setting, you would say, okay, look, today we started this research project. Here is some information. Here is how you can get engaged. Um, and the half an hour for, the, uh, for this kind of exercise is nearing its end. So uh, by now, we should actually be in this uh, mood of, OK, how, what are the next steps? Uh, who do we want to collaborate with? Are there maybe some NGOs or some others who can help us with assessing this? Has some other library already done it? Should we con contact those guys in Helsinki? Is there some library in Germany that has already done it? Is there some other Leibniz Institute that has done it? Does Leibniz offer anything in this regard, right? All of these things are questions that we could pose ourselves, and then we could distribute the workload. We basically just uh, line up what, what are these questions, and then we, we write down who, who's going to do it. And if we've done it, then there's some sort of a response. We could say, OK, yeah, we, we got some uh, info from like Leibniz Central that they have this and that on the meta, or they don't have anything, right? Um, but we have a record of this. And all of this could be in public, and we could invite the crowd to participate, right? Um, and also, I chose this as an example because it's cross-disciplinary. I didn't know what your, in, uh, your um, disciplinary background is. But the uh, approach in general can be applied to almost anything. And now some people will say, yeah, but I'm working with private data. I'm working with patients or with uh, uh, human subjects or something like this. And then, uh, of course, yeah, you wouldn't share everything. But at this stage, where you haven't actually gathered any personally identifiable data, you can still share the entire setup of your project. And at some point, you will have to have interfaces to some non-public things. And for that, um, I have actually prepared something. Not sure where we see this. Yeah, at each step, um, we should consider who would benefit from the methodology data or other outcomes being shared. Who would benefit from this not being shared? Who is at risk of damage if something is shared or not shared, right? And that's something uh, that, for some for reasons of this pad mechanics here, uh, we didn't actually do. Um, at the be beginning, we should consider who would benefit from the research being performed, who would benefit from the research not being performed, who is a, at risk of damage from the research being performed or not being performed. These are questions that we should actually ask ourselves all the time, in irrespective of the research project we're uh, part of, but for the moment, this is, these questions are only asked in certain disciplines because there are legal requirements for ethical review. But I think even if you're doing uh, 
astronomy, space mechanics, or whatever, where there is no re legal requirement for ethical review, you should still ask those questions. You should document that you've engaged with those questions. Yeah, we should also talk about licensing. So if you contribute to the pad, then I uh, hear it's written that uh, you dedicate this to the public domain. We will see whether if we continue this, that's the way to go. Uh, but at least if, it's, if this part is in the public domain, then anything else is possible later. If we are already defining something now, then it might restrict f uh, future um, contributions. Okay, so the half an hour of this interactive pad thingy is now um, kind of over. We have roughly 15 minutes left for the traditional um, kind of interaction, questions, comments. Let's see whether anyone has written any, no, nothing written here yet. So uh, let's zoom back on uh, the title of this uh, session, um, which should be here. Iterating between ideas, communities, and societal impact. I think I've talked about the ideas, to some extent about communities and societal impact. I haven't really talked about the iteration part that much yet, but it's kind of obvious, right? We need to first have an overview of the project, then we need to decompose it into little things at some regular intervals, and you need to actually check whether the little things that we're working on as part of the project, especially if we're a distributed team, whether those little things still fit together. Uh, that's what meetings or um, midterm reports or so uh, could be doing, um, but we could think of other mechanisms. Yeah, and in base, uh, and also iteration can have other dimensions. So we could be iterating between different parts of uh, ZBMate or between different aspects of the environmental footprint, or we could be iterating um, between different libraries and so on. Or uh, ZBMate might at some point do this on an annual basis, or even as a dashboard, like give me the current environmental footprint of today uh, so far, right? Data-wise, this is possible, but we haven't built the workflows to allow it, right? We have dashboards for all sorts of things. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, let me see whether we, we can actually uh, do that. I had one uh, that worked yesterday uh, in the other uh, thing. So here, let's see whether that works. It has an audio and uh, and uh, a visual component. So if there, uh, if the tech guys could uh, play around with audio, that would be nice. But it may not work because uh, lots of Wi-Fi is actually block the port that does the audio here. Okay. Anyway, you can imagine audio. Uh, this is a live visualization of Wikipedia edits, essentially. And I can click around here and add Wikidata to it, for instance. Oh yeah, and there is sound. And uh, if we can do this, Wiki is a uh, complicated system. Well, we can, in principle, do this for anything that has open data, right? But we don't do it. And so just imagine having some sort of a live visualization of the environmental footprint of anything, or even of the scientific footprint of ZPMED or any, any other unit that you're interested in. Technically, it's possible. Socially, we're not ready yet. And um, so we, we haven't built the workflows to do it. Okay, well, with that, I'll shut up for a moment and wait for questions, comments, and hope for a lively discussion. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>